We're delighted to continue our program with our next alumna speaker, Mary Lou Quinlan, who's been studying women professionally for a long time. Her breadth of knowledge and expertise led to many business accolades, including the coveted Matrix Award from Women in Communication. Her creativity and versatility throughout her careers, careers as a best-selling author, actor, entrepreneur, marketer, speaker, advocate for women, and philanthropist, to name a few. Draw on every dimension of her liberal arts education here at Fordham, coupled with her smart business sense and practices. When you name your company Just Ask a Woman, that says it all. <laughs> the Gabelli School was honored to have her as a commencement speaker in 1995. We are delighted to welcome you back to Fordham, Mary Lou. I noticed um, Father McShane stepped out, and so I grabbed a microphone. I'm going to be back and forth, but I just wanted to be a little closer to you. I learned um, two things that I have in common with him, I guess. In, um, we lived down in the East Village, my husband Joe and I. And it was February, and we were kind of tooling around Nolita. And I was looking in the stores on Mulberry, around there. And Joe drifted off. And then he came back, and he said, guess what? I went into St. Patrick's Basilica, the old St. Pat's, the Irish church, you know, and they have a sale on like what I would call cryptominiums. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, I brought our grave. <laughs> so kind of like the grandmother of Mc Father McShane. <laughs> yeah, so we have, in fact, it's so New York-y, it's like a little um, box that you go in at the end, and Joe's such a good husband that he actually bought the neighboring one for my parents who have died. <laughs> And so they're, but they're, they're in Philadelphia, right? They are not coming to New York until I'm there. We have to be together. Um, but anyway, that's one Father McShane thing in common. Uh, the other thing is he talked about the Jesuits talking out loud about money and a reluctance to speak out loud about money. And I, I didn't know, you know, Mary in her speech also talked about women and a little bit of reticence, you know, in terms of talking about money. And I'm like, nah, nah, I talk about it. But let me tell you a story. I had been president of something called New York Women in Communications. And it's one of these things where you go to a lot of meetings. It's a whole year of being involved. You get to the end and they have their last meeting and they give you a gift, a thank you. So the women said, what do you want? And I said, well, I really love H. Stern Jewelers. It'd be really neat to get any kind of gift certificate to H. Stern. So I went up to the top, and they said, thank you very much for your service. Here is your gift certificate from H. Stern. Thank you so much. And I put it in my jacket pocket and went back to the back of the room. Now, Susie Orman was the guest speaker at that meeting. So I'm just standing in the back of the room, feeling quite content. And she said, girlfriend, what's in the bag? What's in the envelope? Did you open it? <laughs> I'm like, well, no, um, of course I didn't open it. How rude would that be to like see how much? She said, what is it with women and money? How much did they give you? You open it right now. So I had to do it out loud. So today we are going to be talking about money. But there's one more thing I want to say. Well, there's a lot of things I want to say. <laughs> and... Um, we all have a reason for being here. Like, yes, we have a Fordham Association. I'm an MBA student, by the way. I want to get, just set the record straight. My liberal arts background was from another Jesuit school in Philadelphia, St. Joe's. That's okay. I went to, I did a lot of school stuff. But um, I got my MBA here at night. Um, and I didn't have an everyday connection with Fordham. And some of the other women at the table were saying the same thing, that, you know, you probably, if you, if you got your MBA at night, you were probably working. So you're kind of in here, out, in, out. But we do things for personal reasons, don't we? When we're inspired by somebody. And the reason I'm here is the woman who put this together. And I'd have to say she's a heck of a spark plug. And that's the Director of Development. Thank you, Hope Ogletree. Now, there's one more thing, personal. This is called taking it personally. Is that up there? Nope, I'm gonna hit my little clicker do. There we go, taking it personally. I love to get personal. And I must really love you and Fordham because I am standing here in high heels. Now there's, because there's one thing uh, that, that Martha didn't say in the introduction, uh, which was very gracious. She just left off one small detail. 
As a little girl, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said, I want to be a dancer. Um, and I, I did take tap and jazz, and, and I even danced in college. I got A's in philosophy and in math by figuring a way to incorporate dancing in front of the class. And it worked um, at St. Joe's in Philadelphia. And I held on to my dream, but when I graduated in 1975, I traded my ballet shoes for high heels and a job that paid. And I figured, you know, I guess dancing's in the past. Never say never. I got home at about... 11 o'clock, which is pretty good. Last night, after three straight days of dancing in a competitive ballroom dancing competition. <laughs> yes. So when, I, so where's our little guy here? Did I do all right? Oh, there I am. <laughs> oh yes, oh, it's embarrassing. Tango, waltz, cha-cha, rumba. I actually got um, two first place trophies, which I was very proud of. I did not bring them, but I reached into my purse looking for a prop, and I thought, hey, anybody need a fake tan? This is still in there. <laughs> so, so the high heels are killing me right now. I'm totally flip-flops when this is over. Um, but I really had a great time, and I know that the tan was fake, and my eyelashes were fake, but I can tell you standing here right now looking at all of you women in this moment, in this room, 100% genuine joy. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I always believe in getting personal. You know, when people, I'm just going to take this pretty binder off here because I need room for my toys. There. Okay. Um, I believe in getting personal. Now, people say in business, oh, it's just business, it's not personal. They usually say that about five minutes before they fire you. <laughs> it is personal. I don't buy it. It is personal. Because if you love what you do and you give your all, it's personal. And I spent my whole career trying to bring myself, my whole self, you know, persistence and passion, the warts and worries, the humor and the hope, all of it, to work with me. And really I had to because my career has been all about women as consumers and as professionals. And I believe that as women, we live more sound and successful lives if we'd only honor that personal voice that is uniquely ours and embrace it and live it out loud. It's so much easier than struggling to mimic who we're supposed to be or acting as if we don't care or we're cool with discrimination or ethical shortcuts just to fit into a corporate culture. Life ideally is long, and your health and your relationships and your sleep well, thank you if you choose a career where you can be yourself and take it personally. And I especially offer that to the young women in this room. There are women here who are undergraduates, and you have lots of choices and opportunities. Always look in the mirror and ask yourself, is this really right for who I am inside? So that's how I relate to this topic of women's philanthropy, personally. You know, I told the organizers, um, I don't call myself a philanthropist. It's such a Weird word, it sounds too formal, it sounds scary. It's like sitting on a big bag of money and here, anybody who passes by, here's some money. But no, like I prefer the word advocate. I'm an advocate for people and institutions and causes I believe in. I care about them, I speak for them, I volunteer for them, I fight for them, and yeah, I give to them. So what does women's philanthropy mean to me? I'm all in. But baby, I wasn't born this way. <laughs> I grew up in a row house in North Philadelphia. I was the older sister to, I'm trying to make my brother Jack. <laughs> There's Jack. Yeah, he's the redhead. He got the red hair. I got ripped off. Um, but uh, we were uh, brother and sister there on the steps of our house in Philadelphia, the daughter of two wonderful parents who, like Father McShane described, worked and sacrificed so my brother and I could go to Catholic school and have happy, safe little lives. Our philanthropy was $2 in the weekly collection basket, maybe five on Christmas. That, and selling Girl Scout cookies, and paying tuition was all the donating I remember. And then Mary, I confess, I dropped out of Daisy Troop number 56. I barely survived Camp Laughing Waters. But that's another story. Um, but my mother taught me a different way to give. Back in the 60s, my mom, yes, do the math, my mom, Mary, was the only mom in the neighborhood who worked. There she is as a secretary in an ad agency. And that was back in the days when other little girls would say to me, oh, your mom has to work. 
<laughs> well, yeah, my mom did work. She had a lot of jobs. In fact, she had a lot of jobs because if she didn't like the situation, she'd call my dad, Ray, pick me up at lunch because I'm not staying here because <laughs> these people aren't nice. And she'd quit and get another job on the spot, one that made her feel happy. Um, that was my mom, you know, and her philanthropy, she, she invented a special way of praying. Whenever my mom had a wish or a worry, she'd grab a pen, nearest piece of paper, like any old scrap, some little tear off of that paper right there, she'd address, date it, address it, dear God, write down the concern, sign it, love Mary, fold it, and put it in her little God box, a little wicker container for her prayers and petitions, and she would let it go. Now, over the years, when Jack or I, my brother, had a problem with our jobs or our health, we'd say, hey, Mom, could you put it in the God box? And she'd say, yeah, I'll put it in the box. But if you bring it up again because you think you can handle it better, it's coming out. <laughs> Believe me, the God box filled and filled. So that was, that was her philanthropy, you know. And when I married Joe, oh, let me get Joe up here. This is personal, I told you. He doesn't even know he's in this. He's golfing right now. <laughs> oh, honeymoon picture. Um, when I married Joe, uh, he was from a similar Philadelphia background, but he had a bigger concept of giving back. He learned it at his own college, which was Haverford in Pennsylvania, where he served as a student member of the university's board. When I, went, when I met him, between his generosity and his Amex card, I mean, I only had a visa. It's like, whoa, I thought he must be rich. So his lessons rubbed off on me. We moved to New York City to begin our married life and new careers. And I started my career wearing that business uniform of the 80s. Oh, come back there, there we go. I'm channeling Melanie Griffith and the working girls. I, I look at that, you know, the pantsuits and the bow ties, and when I think back, I thought that business uniform was the biggest waste of the cutest years of my life. <laughs> But anyway, onward and upward. So that's how I got to Fordham for my MBA. Um, it was just a few blocks away from my job at Avon. That was over at 57th and 5th at the time. And they paid for it. Thank you, Avon, forever. And um, we lived on 56th Street between 8th and 9th. So Fordham Lincoln Center was geographically desirable. And I remember running here at the end of a long work day, and I would be watching the clock, you know, and I'm at the office, like, just one more minute, one more meeting, one more call, and then, you know, run, 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 and I'd get into the seat at the very last second, and just take notes, take notes, take notes, um, and then I'd get out at the end, and I can remember Joe standing there sometimes on a rainy, rotten day like this weather, and he'd have a pizza from Ralph's uh, at the corner, and that was the reward, and, and soon it was time to start giving back. You know, as women, we don't give really to get the credit. We give because of what matters to us, to make a difference, as Mary said. You know, we give because we take something personally. And during the early days of my career, um, I didn't make a lot of money, but I started to donate first to my Philadelphia grade school and high school. Not big amounts, but I knew my schools had fallen on hard times, and I wanted other kids to have the same experience I had had. Now, did I call that philanthropy? No. Loyalty. And when students and parents would write to me saying that because of my help, a child had been able to stay in the school or that a mother could afford a mortgage or a medical bill, it felt good and right. In the first two decades of our marriage, our giving list expanded to include Joe's grade school, high school, and college, as well as mine. And in fact, on our 25th wedding anniversary, we returned to Philadelphia to renew our wedding vows, and we drove to our schools and met with the principals and handed them a gift of thanks for the values that had helped sustain us in our adult life together. Now, my two biggest gifts to my growing up schools had different outcomes. Despite my contributions, my high school, Cardinal Doherty High School in Philadelphia, closed. It was a heartbreak. But at least several years worth of kids, you know, had a chance because of my scholarships. And, and what if I'd sat back and not helped? I know I'd carry that guilt with me for not trying. Guilt works too, by the way. I'm sorry, I'm trying to make these go. 
where's my little emoji? Now it's just white. Did it go away, the pictures? Where's my friend? Hello, AV friend. I don't know what happened either. I could make little shadow animals. Here we go. Did I not hit the right button? See how it's playing? The battery? No, no, no. Screen. Oh, I'm covering the screen. I blanked out the screen. Thank you, sir. So, let's see if it comes up. Oh, that was paying it forward. Nope, nope, nope. It's too far. Oh, you know why I kept hitting that button? You know how we do that when something doesn't work? You don't ask for instructions or read them. You just like, oh, there it is. See? Guilt. Guilt works, too. Um, my other gift, so the first one, as I said, the school closed. The second one, my other gift was to my undergraduate university, St. Joe's. And, you know, sometimes we give to an institution, and sometimes we're inspired by an individual. I had said how inspired I am by hope. Well, in the St. Joe's case, I was particularly inspired by then-president Father Tim Lannan, uh, an amazing Jesuit and human being. And I felt such trust and hope in his leadership that I decided to endow a scholarship that would largely focus on young women with good grades who had big career dreams, but were short on funds. I knew that girl. I was that girl. 17 students have benefited from the scholarship over the years, several for multiple years. And they write the most wonderful essays sharing what the education meant to them. I brought a little snippet of one from Sabrina Blakely. She's a, a current student. I am one of four children, so college tuition is a considerably large financial burden for my parents. Last spring, I started to notice the amount of stress tuition was causing them, and therefore I applied for a few outside scholarships. God is good to me, and I was lucky enough to receive one, an incredible blessing to my family. And I give in other ways, too. You know, there's so many things we can do. Speaking to students, serving as a trustee at St. Joe's for 10 years, volunteer teaching a marketing class. Is that philanthropy? I don't know. I call it paying it forward. And throughout my career in advertising, you know, I did have a career in advertising, a long one, uh, my mom was my career cheerleader. As a working woman herself during the real Mad Men days, oh my gosh, every night at the dinner table she'd come home and say, oh, they're having an affair, he's drunk at his desk, he took money. It was just like Mad Men. Um, she shared all the trials and the crazies of my life at the office. And we were more than best friends. We were soulmates. We had our own language. I mean, if you'd heard us talking, you would have said, what? But we'd be talking, and then suddenly, one of us would say, more, and the other would come back, more, 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 more. It meant, I love you more. And at the end of every phone call, we talked every night. We'd put our hands on the receiver. We'd say, hands on. That meant we're never apart. And when we sent each other cards or letters, I traced my hand. Every finger, every little bump, hands on. And when she dropped me at the airport, I'd run to the car window and put my hand on the glass, hands on. Yep, that was me and mom. And with her cheering us on, our lives transitioned from the business world. Now, Joe, in New York, we lived down in the East Village, I think I said, he went for a master's degree in Irish and Irish American studies at NYU, and our interests expanded to include Irish arts and educational causes. And it always comes back to the personal, doesn't it? Joe's father, taught poetry and drama in a Philadelphia public school for almost, well, four decades plus 20, 25 more years in a local community college. And he loves the Irish poet Seamus Heaney. So now, each year, and this just happened last Thursday night at NYU, I'll show you a picture. This is Tom, this is my father-in-law, and that's Seamus Heaney, the Nobel Prize winning poet, who's a late poet now, but a, just a, the most gifted man on walk to the face of the earth. So there is such a thing as the Tom Quinlan Lecture for the annual winner of the Seamus Heaney Poetry Prize. It's a mouthful, but just last week, my father-in-law, Tom, who is now 92, read a poem before a university audience of poetry scholars. Do I call that philanthropy? Nope. I call it honoring our family. And for me, well, my life took an unexpected turn. My mother died from a stroke May 29th, 2006. And suddenly, worrying about clients' marketing concerns paled without the light in my life. And after three days with her in hospice, I lost her. 
But the day before her funeral, I found her God box. Well, not one. Here is the story. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to need your help, Liz. I can tell you right now. I know what I don't know. I'm happy to say that the God Box, I had written books before about marketing and business and women's careers, but this one, um, it hit the New York Times bestseller in, list in three weeks, and I know what my mom would have said, of course it did, it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother's little box of prayers and prayer philanthropy, really, were filled with gratitude um, for us, for families, for friends, even strangers, and many of the notes were about my career. I found one, it was in a little scrap of paper. Please let Mary Lou win the Liberty Mutual account. Meeting at 4 p.m. <laughs> you know, I'd, for I'd forgotten about that one, but my, my mom didn't forget about a pitch in advertising for 20 years. You know, I found them on the back of a Ruby Tuesdays coaster and a dry cleaner receipt and, and my dad's prescriptions. She always had my back. And I found one, dear God, please find, oh no, sorry, this one was to St. Anthony, of course. Dear St. Anthony, please find a publisher for Mary Lou's new book. P.S. Get her on Oprah, Good Morning America, and The View. Love, Mary. <laughs> but writing the book wasn't enough for me, not for my mom, not for what I wanted to give back. And I just wanted to do more to keep her in the world. So almost 40 years after leaving the stage for the corner office, I developed a one-woman play, The God Box, A Daughter's Story. There I am, okay. And um, it's a tribute to her, but really to daughters and caretakers and, and hospice workers around the world. I performed the show nearly 150 times to share that love with every daughter or son who ever loved their mother. I talked to audiences one, after, one by one after the shows, and I have held more than my share of people who see their families in my story. And the God Box brings back memories and moments, and I've often heard, I don't have the relationship with my mom that you had with yours, but I'm gonna call her as soon as I get in the car. That's my best reward. So I decided to dedicate the entire effort, the book, the sales, the play tickets, even an app, to raising money, oh, the book's in your bag too, it's a gift from me, I sign them all, um, to raising money for cancer and hospice and education charities. I've performed the show in dozens of theaters around the US, I've done it here in New York, I hope to do it again in New York. I've taken it to Off-Broadway, the Edinburgh Fringe, and to uh, last fall a 10-city tour in Ireland. Over the past five years, the God Box Project has raised over $500,000 for local charities. Do I call that philanthropy? No. I call it love. 
Giving back can be time, talent, or treasure. Whether they, whatever gifts we've been given, that's what we can share. And it varies over your life, what you're able to do. And what about Fordham? You know, Fordham was there for me in those early career years. And even in later years, Martha mentioned that I gave the Gabelli commencement speech in 95, a true honor. But that speech was literally a life-changing anchor for me. The commencement was on a Sunday. And I never told anyone at Fordham. But the Friday, right before that Sunday, my CEO at the ad agency abruptly quit. Walked out cold the end. I was the president at that time. And that whole weekend, no one knew but me. And I knew that in the coming week, I'd have to face frightened employees, the testy trade press, cutthroat competitors as an agency knocked back on its heels. But I gritted down and gave that speech that Sunday with every ounce of confidence and hope I could muster. And on Monday morning, I stepped into my new life as CEO. So today, I am joining this terrific new circle of women that you're going to hear about. who are taking Fordham and the needs of women just like us personally. Thank you, Susie Orman, for telling me to say it out loud, but I am proud to pledge $10,000 over the next four years to the first Women's Philanthropy Graduate Business Scholarship Circle for, maybe it's you, another young woman who might be grabbing a slice of pizza on the way from work to class as she stretches to get ahead. I hope each of you might consider how you can find your own personal reason to join us. Philanthropy, gratitude. We're in this together. We are connected through our relationships, all different kinds of relationships with Fordham, but particularly the passion we have to help other women for all the women who have helped us. We are powerful women who can make a difference by bringing ourselves to the table. Are you with me? Hands on.